Dear Father God, we praise your holy name and we thank you for today and we thank you for the truth that you have shown us in your Son and in your Word. And Father, I pray that your Spirit would open our hearts and our minds to understand and trust in your Word. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. So where we are today is we are in Colossians. Last week we gave, we did kind of an introductory um, purview of the uh, uh, of this uh, amazing letter, and this week we are going to begin at the beginning. This is where we are in the quarter. So we're we're going to only look at eight verses um, this morning, Lord willing. Uh, David um, can preach on on 25 verses, but we're going to stick to just eight. Um, and this is kind of just looking at an outline of Colossians. This is where we are in the outline because there is, um, you know, a, a greeting and a thanksgiving, and that's what we're going. That's all that we're going to consider this morning. And these are sections that are very often skipped by people. You know, at least when they're reading it, and you, you're like, yeah, 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 but you skip over this part. But it's important because it's this is just as inspired as you know John three sixteen and all the the famous uh, meaty verses, but this is the Word of God just as well. So what we're going to see today is the Gospel. And the word Gospel just means good news. So I, I, I might start off just by kind of asking you, what's the best news you ever got? Aside from when someone told you about the truth of the Gospel. I mean, if... Um, see, on, on the... Uh, on the side here, we have a picture, I believe it's probably New York on VJ Day. Anybody remember what VJ Day is? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's the day the unconditional surrender was kind of finalized and the victory over Japan was ensured. Does anybody know what day it is? No, it's not today. It's in September 2nd, really, I think is when it's most often recognized. But, um, but that was very good news. I think my own grandfather was on the way to in a boat to um, the Pacific Rim um, when that announcement came over. And so he, they got to, uh, it, it means he got to come home, right? So what's the best news you ever got? Does anybody have any, any great news they ever got that, that was just kind of amazing news? When your uncle came home, okay. Yeah, okay. My wife said yes. Okay. You ask your wife to marry you and she said yes. Yes. And, and there are a lot of times that, that, that we get good news and that's, and that's great news. Or my, or my wife's going to have a baby or, or things like that. I mean, those are oftentimes you can get good news, which, which is just um, lightens the heart. The, the word gospel, here it is right there, ewangelion, and... Um, you, you kind of see in the middle of that word, the word angel, right? An angel is one who carries a message, one who carries news, a messenger. An angel is a messenger, a messenger. That is the function of angels. And, but the word uh, ewangelion, it comes from in ancient times, and especially in the Greeks, when if you remember all of the Peloponnesian Wars and all the wars that happen in, in uh, Greek history, when the battle was over, um, a soldier would go back to his home city and would carry the news. And they would, the people of the, of the city would be looking for the news of how the battle went. And so they would be watching and hoping that he would be coming and maybe carrying a laurel wreath um, or, or, or have something about his step which would be the sign that they were getting good news. This is Juneteenth. It is Juneteenth. That's right. That's right. The, 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 that's right. But, but definitely a sign of, of, of liberation of, um, of, of slaves and, and rest restoration of human dignity to a lot of people. Um, 
but you know, also on, if you remember on, on Christmas morning, I bring you, uh, and the Christmas story, I bring you good, not, good news of great joy. And that was delivered by an angel. Um, in these verses, verses 3 through 8, it's, that's really one sentence that these, these uh, verses are. And we're going to read about the gospel, and he's going to give several aspects of the gospel that he's going to refer to. And, and look for these when we read it and study. You're going to see that the gospel is received by faith. It, it results in love. It rests in hope. It reaches the whole world. It reproduces fruit. It is rooted in grace. And it is reported by people. You'll see all of these things, all these different aspects of the gospel in this short section that we're going to read. So please allow me to read this now. This is New American Standard Version. Starting chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, to the saints and faithful helpers in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world, also it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing even as it has been doing in you since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf, and he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. I have a question. Yes. Uh, and the simplest answer is probably the correct one, but I want to make sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Is that one group he's talking, or is he saying saints and faithful brethren? Well, I can always count on you, TC, to, to get ahead of us just a little bit. Yes, that is one and the same group. Okay. And another way to understand that is the saints, even the faithful brethren. Okay. But yes, he is, he is speaking to one particular group of saints, the faithful brethren that are in the city of Colossae. But he starts with the, uh, the word that he starts all of his letters with, and that's his own name. He, he's, he, in, uh, in ancient times, ancient letters, they started with the name of the author, which kind of makes sense, right? Otherwise, which is kind of better than our way of doing it, if you want to figure out who it's from, you gotta, you got to flip down to the end. Oh, this is Paul writing this. I wish I'd have known, right? So, um, but no, he begins with his, his letter, and, and boy, just the name kind of, if once you've been studying the Word of God for a while, you begin to love this man, Paul. What, a, um, what a, uh, an amazing man, and what God did in his life. You know, Paul was, he was born in a city called Tarsus, which is a, a, actually was a pretty prominent city in ancient times. And he studied to become a rabbi under a man named Gamaliel. Gamaliel was um, the greatest teacher of that time. That's kind of the equivalent of having an Ivy League education um, very, to, to be tutored by him. And he ultimately became a Pharisee. And not only was he a Pharisee, he became the, um, for the Sanhedrin, he was the chief prosecutor of Christians. With, with greater zeal than anyone, he saw the, um, this group of followers of this man named Jesus as being um, the greatest um, blasphemy and pursued them in order to have them arrested and killed. And he took great um, 
took that job very seriously and worked very hard at it. So hard that he, at one point he took, he got letters of um, really re probably like letters of arrest and letters of credit on his own. And he went to Damascus in order to hunt down Christians that were there. But on the way there, he had a life, a life transforming experience where he was knocked from um, his horse to the ground by a flood of light. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And that's when he said, who are you, Lord? And he didn't know who it was, but he said, whoever this is, that's who I'm following now. That's who my Lord is. And that was how the Lord Jesus um, introduced himself to, to Saul and um, called him into the ministry. Um, but that's in Acts chapter 9. But um, ultimately he was instructed for three years um, in the Nabataean wilderness by the, the risen Lord Jesus himself. And he um, ended up going back to um, Tarsus and ultimately was called to be a pastor in Syrian Antioch. And he was, he was one of the pastors there. And then he um, ended up going with, with Barnabas on missionary journeys, if you remember. And, he then, and then he went with Silas on some. He went on three missionary journeys through Asia Minor and through Greece and wrote 13 books of the New Testament. Of course, if we had one letter from this man, it would be the greatest of treasures, and we have 13 of them. Um, but at this point, as we talked about last week, he's under arrest. He's in, in, he's in prison at home um, in the city of Rome. He is handcuffed to a Roman soldier. That is, the, that is where he is when he's writing this letter. This is one of the four so-called prison epistles. So that's who this letter is from. And he introduces himself as an apostle. And, he's, and this is to firmly establish his authority. Because an apostle, the word apostle means sent. Someone who was sent. Usually, a, a, a lot of times in, in um, Israel, the uh, Sanhedrin would send an apostle to other cities and villages, and he was one who had all the authority invested in the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin when he went there. And so an apostle was um, the highest office in the church, under, which is under, of course, the headship of Christ. And so he is establishing his authority and his rank in this because he is going to be directive to them. Um, but notice he is an apostle. I'm not a, an apostle of the church in Jerusalem. The, the, uh, the twelve did not send me. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has called me to be an apostle. When he met him on the road to Damascus, and um, he said, I'm going to make you an apostle to the Gentiles. And he's told Ananias, that he's going to show him how much he must suffer for the gospel's sake. Um, and, but then he also says, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. He's saying, I wasn't recruited by Barnabas to be an apostle. I wasn't recruited by Peter or the twelve to join their group. I, wasn't, um, I also didn't campaign for this office. I didn't say, you know what, when I grow up, I want to be an apostle. I'm going to study to be an apostle and go to apostle school and then sign up for the job. You know, he says, this is God's decision. God made this choice. God called me out. If I could do any other job, I would do it. But this is God's will um, that I be an apostle. Um, kind of hard to argue with his um, with this authority, isn't it? I'm an apostle called by God. Um, and then he says, and Timothy, our brother. Um, now, Timothy is not, he's not a, 
co-author here, but Timothy is with Paul in Rome um, while he's under house arrest. He's, he's his companion while he's there. And these people, sounds like they probably know Timothy. Timothy was uh, a young man who was from a city called Lystra. Who um, He had a Jewish mother. He had a Greek father. And he was led to Christ probably during Paul's first missionary journey. And then on his second missionary journey, he decided that Timothy um, should go with him. And he actually, and Timothy was uncircumcised, so he circumcised him so that it wouldn't be an issue when they went to the synagogues in the city where he was going to go. And so he, um, and so he, Timothy accompanied him on the second missionary journey and on the third missionary journey. And Timothy was very, very useful to Paul, very beloved. Um, he said, no one um, is a better example of who I am than Timothy. And so very often, he, in some of these letters, he would say, you know, I wish I could be there, but since I can't be there, I'm sending you Timothy because he's the next best thing. You kind of get that idea. Also, um, Michael, yes. Uh, Timothy having a Jewish mother would be considered a Jew right. regardless of the father. Yes. Had it been the other way around, if he had had a Jewish father and uh, a Greek mother, he would have been considered a Gentile. Right. It would, it's funny how they had that distinction. But yes, it's through the through the mother's line. It's, it is. Yes, it's and line. and he would he would have to be more distant of a proselyte, if you will, yeah. of a convert. They do that because there's never any doubt who the mother is, but there's always ah. going to be a question of the paternity. Didn't think of that. That mm -hmm. makes sense too. And the problem was your seed. Right. And, and, and Timothy was um, an interesting um, young man. I say young because he was probably around 20 when Paul first um, um, met him. And so he's, he's, I mean, usually rabbis were not younger than 30. And so, and, 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 um, so a lot of people... Some, some he had to deal with being younger a little bit in in his life, yes. Sickly, Sickly. yeah. And Paul, Paul in some of his letters w refers to a, um, like a, he had stomach problems, oh, okay. and he needed he needed to take some wine for your stomach, and he's kind of he and and um, there are some other places that kind of refer to that, but he's he's but he's also kind of timid. When you read First and Second Timothy, you get this idea that he's not this bold and brash kind of, you know, Peter the Apostle rock kind of personality. But he's, um, but he was also nobody was more of a comfort to Paul. Nobody was more of a comfort or or more of a solace to Paul in in his life. And so, um, and interesting that the last letter that we have that he wrote in his life is to Timothy. Right, Second Timothy. So, so it's Paul and Timothy that are there. So then he says, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. And saints means holy ones, right? And that word for holy or saints, it means those who are set apart. Now, how many of the Christians in Colossae were saints? All of them. Just like you know how many believers today are saints. All of them. Because in order to be a saint, you have to be one who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. That makes you a saint. Not um, doing a couple of miracles and having paintings made of you and having people pray to you for hundreds of years after, after your death. The word saint or holy one, it really doesn't imply any particular righteousness or morality. It means you've been set apart. Um, the Bible in the Old Testament talks about holy bread. We call this a holy book, the Bible. It, the book has no morality to it. But it's separate from all other books. 
the bread is not is separated from all other bread because it is separated for a holy purpose. And just like that, um, the people of God are set apart unto Him, set apart from the profane, the what is what is the common. This is set apart to Him. So, you believers, if you are one who trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a saint. You can now refer to yourselves as. St. Ricardo, St. MC, that's right. St. Michael, it kind of sticks in your mouth, yes. The, the Romans do. I uh, would expect that the Greek Orthodox probably do also. Um, and it's the words, the words wrongly used in a lot of way, but most, most often the Roman church does. I mean, just like there are also people that misuse the word apostle. I'm talking about apostles today. Certain, certain, um, certain preachers who are um, exaggerate their own self-worth will start referring to themselves as apostles, megalomaniacs, and that sort of thing. Well, Michael and the Catholics, it seems to me that they want to have men being in different positions. And we, as Christians, believe even our pastor is a saint and we're all equal under God. Yes. You know, the only one we want to exalt really is Jesus Christ. Yes. And they have a different system. They want to do everything. Right. Yes. Well, yeah, and the, the, uh, the idea that uh, the ethical and moral superiority of all these uh, of certain people is uh, labeled like right. sainthood. Uh, but it's really, uh, uh, I think, based on, on, on their work. Right. They're also trying to preach another gospel. Exactly. Right, right. And, 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 but then he also says, these saints have been faithful brethren. He, he, he says that, yes, you saints are, um, not only are you set apart, but you do have a measure of faithfulness. And you are, you're in the family, you're brothers and sisters. And then he gives them this greeting, because he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Um, I, I've, a lot of times will sign my letters to people I have write as grace to you because that is, it is a greeting. Um, the, it's the most beautiful word in the Bible. It's grace. Charis. And it, it, it was so beloved and so precious to Christians. That's how they started, that's what they started using as their greeting. <coughs> Grace to you. Um, and grace means, we'll talk more about grace in a minute, but grace is unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. Which means that it is a blessing that you have received that you did not deserve. It's unmerited. So it is a, a blessing that is a gift. That's what grace is. Which is, the grounds of our entire relationship with God, isn't it? The fact that He would even um, relate to us, reach out to us at all, is grace. But then He also pairs that with peace from God our Father. And this is the Greek equivalent of the Jewish word which is so common, shalom. Shalom that they used for greetings and farewell and which was the highest ideal of uh, Jewish um, blessing was peace. So grace to you and peace from God our Father. So then he gives, begins his thanksgiving and he says, we give thanks to God. That's, and and kind of one, something I want to notice here, he doesn't say, I want to thank you for listening and obeying what we told you. Because we really appreciate somebody showing up to you know, listen to all these lessons that we're giving. No, he gives thanks to God where he should. The thanks is directed to God himself. I mean, it's kind of funny. I mean, sometimes, um, like on Thanksgiving, 
people will begin expressing sometimes thanks to one another for certain things or to their parents or to friends, and, which is all fine and good. But the point of thanksgiving is to offer up thanks to God above f for his blessings. Um, and I say whom Paul had never met. Remember, Paul had never met these people. He'd never been there. He's going to refer to that later on in the letter. He'd never met this body of, of Christians at this point. Um, and, you know, one of the, I think I said that one of the, pre the themes of this letter is going to be the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ over all others. That there is no one on his level. He's on par with no one. He's not on equal ground. No one else even deserves to be named on the stage. And he says, we give thanks to God, comma, who is the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. None of these other people that, um, that you may be um, considering as learning from or taking instruction from are um, have can claim that God is their father. The Lord Jesus Christ, his father is God himself. Um, and he says, we're praying always for you. That, that doesn't mean they're always praying. What he means is, I mean, they prayed a lot, but what he means is when we pray, we always pray for you. We always remember you in our prayers. Um, and so, like I said, he's going to lay out in these verses seven things about the gospel. And the number one thing he's, he, he mentions is faith. And faith is the instrumental cause of salvation. Think about that for a minute. Faith is the instrumental cause of salvation. It is what causes you to be saved. And it is faith alone which is going to be important in this letter. It's not faith and something else. It's not faith and your, your good behavior. It's not faith and some ritual. It's not faith and higher knowledge like the Gnostics you could talk about. Some mysteries that you gain. It's not that and faith. It's faith. Faith alone is what causes your salvation. Yes. Uh, I have to say something here. Mm -hmm. The Baptists believe that sentence, but in the Baptist belief, the faith comes from them. In my belief, God gave us faith just like He gave us grace. Right. And it's from God. And, and so there's, there's a, a thing that is not really mentioned in the Baptist faith, but it's there, is that they think the faith, they got on their own, and then came to Christ. Whereas I believe God gave me grace and faith at the same time. Yes, I mean, that makes sense. faith is a gift from God. That's the way I see it. It is. Faith is a gift from God, and that's, that's what Scripture teaches. Okay. And, um, and when God opens your eyes so that you can see the truth and softens your heart so that you want it, yes. right? And believing the gospel what that means, believing the gospel, same word as, as, as um, faith, pastuo is what is the word there. Believing is to be persuaded that it's true and trusting in that truth. Everyone in this room, um, aside from me at the moment, is trusting in the chair they're sitting in. You don't just look at it and say, yes, that chair can support my weight. You are sitting on it. You're putting all of your weight on it. And your, your trust is well-founded since so far none of you have fallen to the ground. But that is trusting it. It's believing in it. Um, and secondly, not only the second, thing, the second aspect of the gospel is not only believing, but also um, love. Because, because the gospel created love in their hearts. Um, Romans 5 says this, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. If you love God, you will love the church. 
and you will love your neighbor. Where are the two great commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? And um, it's the love of God that, it, that transforms us to, to do that. And the word that um, he uses here for love is agape. You've, you may have heard of this. This is the love of choice. This is the love of the will. This is not, you don't fall into agape. This is self-sacrificing service toward the benefit of someone else. This doesn't mean you like someone else. You can agape love someone you really don't like. I've done it plenty of times. <laughs> and probably other people have done that to me. I don't really like this guy, but I'm going to bless him with this. Not because he deserves it. But this is the love that God had towards us. Because we didn't deserve it. I, you were not lovely when God poured out His grace on you. You were not lovable. I definitely was not lovable. Um, it, this is not about feelings. He's not saying um, that you have lovey-dovey feelings for the saints. He's saying that you bless them in a self-sacrificing way. Because that's what God did for you. And that's a manifestation of the gospel. Um, and then he says, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. 1 Peter chapter 1 said that God has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that you does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. Sometimes people want to um, criticize Christians for having this, um, this otherworldly perspective. Boy, I'm just have my eyes fixed on the sweet by and by, right? Going to go to heaven and, 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 and say, um, you know, what about here and now? Well, the thing is, hope for a Christian means something very different from what the, when the world uses this word hope. So much so that it almost doesn't mean the same thing. Like, I hope we'd beat Alabama this year. And that doesn't mean I strongly desire to beat Alabama this year, which I do. <laughs> hope we beat them badly, not by one point. But, um, but hope for a Christian means this. I'm trusting in God's promise about the future. Hope is future-oriented, isn't it? God has promised me these things, and that's what I hope for. I usually think of it as, as being paired with faith, and that faith is what, this is what God has done and what applies to me. Exactly. Uh, that's right. If, if, if our hope was only in this world, then, then we're most to be pitied, is what Paul says. Right? Um, but this is confidence. Just like, I tr just like I have confidence that Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, I have as much confidence I do about that that I do that He's coming back to establish His kingdom and to bring me into His Father's house. That is paired with that. That is hope in something in the future. Right. At, that's what we hope for. And at that point, it's kind of like David said in, his, in the, the sermon yesterday, that at that point, faith won't be needed because we will see Him. And hope will not be necessary because His promises have been fulfilled at that point. Right? That's great news.
That's great news. In, in Hebrews, he talks about faith in chapter 11 by saying this. Um, but this is faith mixed with hope here in the story of Moses. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the sons of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the reward. Pharaoh was the richest man in the world. And he was a prince in Egypt. And so he could have just relished in the here and now. But he says, I choose to be um, paired with the people of God. I choose that. And rather than the pleasures of sin. Because he looked for the re reward of what was coming for the future. Then moving in on the aspect of the gospel, he says um, that the, this, going back, said, said, you previously heard the word of truth, the gospel. Anybody ever heard that expression, the gospel truth? And that's the gospel truth. Yeah. Uh, kind of a, yeah, that's right. That it's, it's, sounds, like, sounds like Alabama expression there. And that's the gospel. You even hear, you even hear unbelievers say it. That's the gospel truth. Oh, really? You believe the gospel is the truth? Okay. I always like to stop them at that point. Let's go back and talk about the gospel truth rather than talking about this, you know, whatever it is we're talking about. But the gospel truth came to you just as in all the world. You may have missed that, but think about this. The gospel is not a religion for one individual people. And a lot of times they had that in ancient times where... Um, where kind of each nation would kind of have their own God. And each, um, and it may even be that this tribe or this people or, or this village had their own God. He's saying this is the gospel truth for the whole world. For every um, tribe and tongue and nation, there is one Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because He is the one who has created every one of them. And He um, calls people from every tribe and nation to repent and to believe in Him and to join Him in the kingdom of God. Um, and it, it's kind of, um, the gospel is a funny thing in that respect that it's, it's not only, in one respect, I consider the gospel very personal, right? That God rescued me personally from my sin and, um, and transformed me and adopted me as his child and brought me into his family and showers blessings on me. And so there's a very personal me and God side of it, but there's also a universal side of it, that he is the Lord of every man, woman, and child, and every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is the Lord. Um, I bet that got every Jew in the audience <coughs> mad right there. Yeah. Oh, definitely. They didn't. They didn't like that. Yeah, I bet. Right. And um, and and next, this part about bearing fruit. It says the gospel brings forth fruit and grows. And, and this this idea of bearing fruit, it's it's kind of there's kind of an internal aspect to it and an external. Because internally, um, the gospel um, is to have the effect of building the church up. That's that word edify that you see. That the church is to grow and grow more and more into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, because the thing is, the gospel is not just a code of ethics. It's not just a, um, a book of morality that there's actual transforming power in the truth of God. And, and in the Holy Spirit, as it works in our lives, changes us into the likeness of Christ. Um, so that's one aspect of bearing fruit. But the other aspect has to do with expansion, doesn't it? That's often the one that we think about, about the church growing in size as more and more people join they 
hear the truth, as we share the truth, and they join the church, and the church spreads throughout the world as it has. I remember Paul went out from his home church, but he didn't go to the ends of the earth personally. right? Remember how he kept saying that he wanted to go to Spain, which was way out there in, in, his, in his mind. But um, ultimately, the gospel that he um, preached did reach the ends of the earth and is reaching the ends of the earth. Um, so the good news spread. So that's the two part of it bearing fruit as the church building up but also growing in size. And then lastly, um, really not lastly, but, but since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God and truth. Man, grace is the heart of the gospel. The reformer said that, um, that, um, that the gospel that uh, is sola gratia, it's only by the grace of God. Um, there is nothing added to um, the salvation that God brings aside from His grace. It's only His grace that... Um, that determines my salvation. It's His choosing and Him saying, I will pour my blessing on this one that does not deserve it. Um, simply put, it's God giving us what we do not deserve. We, we are giving something that we did not earn that we do not deserve. Um, and adding works and ritual or knowledge mysteries or all these things adding that to the gospel it, it diminishes the beauty of the gospel doesn't it it's not only a lie it's also basically profane it's like why would you think that adds anything to what god has done in his grace it's almost like you you you're insulting god's gift by thinking that you did something to contribute to it. And that's what bothered me about the faith part I mentioned earlier. Right. Because you're taking something that God gave as a gift and trying to make it into something that they had or deserve. Right. And it, it, it kills the grace. Right? Yeah, you, you think that this beautiful work of God that I think my stupidity <laughs> and my wickedness somehow contributed to. Right. right. And then he, in verses 7 and 8, he says, just as you learned it from Epaphras. Now, I remind you that Epaphras was a man from Colossae who, when Paul was in, apparently, in the city of Ephesus, remember he was there for about three years, he came to um, uh, Ephesus and was led to Christ through the church in Ephesus, and probably by Paul himself. And then he took the gospel back to his friends and family in the city of Colossae, and Epaphras really ended up, that's how they, that church got started. And he was saying, you learned this from Epaphras. And by the way, Epaphras is there in Rome with Paul while he's writing this. He had gone to Rome because he had concerns about what's going on now in the church in Colossae. And so he went and visited Paul. And so Epaphras is there with him. Um, but the point is here, the gospel is spread by human messengers, isn't it? God doesn't use, um, you know, it, it, yeah, there, there's, there's, there isn't skywriting that happens on. The Bible didn't come down from a parachute from, from heaven. It's human messengers that bring this out. In Romans chapter 10, it says this, How shall they call on Him in whom they, not, they, whom they haven't believed? They, they won't call on people they haven't believed. But how shall, they not, how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? People won't believe in somebody unless they've heard of Him. And so lastly, how shall they hear without a preacher? People need to we need to, and he's saying there, we need to send preachers to preach the gospel so that people will hear it 
and believe it and then call out to God um, in repentance and in faith. Yes, your actions, and but at some point you got to talk. At some point you have to tell the people the truth of the gospel about what it is. And so the gospel is received by faith. It results in love, rests in hope, reaches the world. It reproduces fruit. It's rooted in grace, and it's reported by people. Did you see all those in just these? Eight verses, really about four, about four or five verses, right? So let me close with this. Um, remember, he's what he's doing in this is he's thanking God um, for what he has done for these people in Colossae. And next, he's going to be praying for them. So I also wanted to ask this: um, Who are you praying for? Sometimes we kind of get in a rut where we only pray for people that have problems. Um, I say that to say this. I mean, do you see a whole lot of prayers in the Bible about people that are sick? There are some. And I'm not saying don't pray for people that are sick. But I'm saying it's a matter of life. It, it happens. We need to pray for people that are sick. But my point is this. You don't only pray for people when they have problems. You know, may, you know maybe people that are doing well and that God is really using, they're going to be the ones that the world is going to hate and the world's going to, going to put their um, target on their back and Satan's going to come at them. Those people need prayer. Those people need prayer for strength and for um, protection. Mm-hmm. And those in leadership, mm-hmm. and that's not about sickness or all that bad right. all the time. Then how do we expect God to bless and grow the church if we don't care? Right. So you know, there's a thing by us praying for our leaders. It actually extends and blesses the church because God sees that we care so much that He's giving us all the gifts. Right. Uh, answered prayer. Yeah. That? Yeah. God moves through the prayers of His people doesn't he? Um, Secondly, the gospel has transforming power. Like I said, it's not just a code of ethics. This isn't just a list of morality. It actually um, transforms people who have made shipwrecks of their lives into his own children. And lastly, you know, Epaphras shared the truth of the gospel with people in Colossae. Who are you sharing it with? When's the last time you, I mean, really told somebody, you know, do you understand that this life that you're living of sin has consequences, has ultimate consequences? Did you know that God loves you and wants to rescue you (coughs) from the judgment that you deserve, just like he did with me? And he provided a savior. He provided a rescue. At some point, you know, they look at our lives and they, they might be impressed by it, they might not. But at some point we have to tell people the truth, the facts of the gospel. And we have to call people to repent at some point. They have to hear the truth. Somebody did to you one time, didn't they? And people need to hear of the rescue that is available to them for their sin. Right. Yes. Let me, <coughs> let me close this in prayer. Dear Father God, we... Um, we thank you that you have um, 
in your grace, uh, reach down to uh, rescue us from our sin. And God, I pray that you would um, open our eyes to see uh, just how amazing your grace is, God, when we see uh, your might and your power and your beauty and your love. And Father, I pray that you would um, that you would give us hearts that want to reflect your holiness and your uh, your love for uh, people who um, who need it. And God, I pray that you would open our mouths and tell them the truth about um, who you are and what you have done to provide rescue for them because of your love. Father, we pray for this morning, this morning's worship that your word and your name might be glorified above all things. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>